And I'm very happy to introduce uh, another of the, the organizers, uh, Kate Roach, uh, who's an associate professor uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University. Kate's 2016 book, Pictures Within Pictures in 19th Century Britain, uh, an Ashgate book published by Routledge, received the Historians of British Art Book Award for Exemplary Scholarship on the period after 1800. She's currently at work on her second book, A History of the Groundbreaking 19th Century Exhibition Society, uh, The British Institution. For research on that project, she was awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship at the Huntingdon Library for the 2017-18 academic year. Thank you, David, um, and thank you to the Center for American Art and to all of you for being here today. Um, my topic today, I will be considering a single exhibition in a single year, a solitary event that nonetheless encapsulates British art's reckoning with new imperial subjects in the second half of the 18th century. In 1806, the newly founded British institution London staged its first exhibition of contemporary art in what would go on to be an annual event. The institution was an explicitly patriotic and imperialist <coughs> venture. Its founders hoped to produce a national school of art that could compete with Britain's European rivals, uh, notably and as always France, and to celebrate its newly expanded empire. In pointed contrast to the nationalized art collections and systematic state patronage available in France, the institution was a voluntary society supported by subscriptions and loans of artworks from private citizens. It was run by a committee of directors from varied politi political, religious, and social backgrounds. What they had in common was that they were all men and they were all affluent. Um, so they had in common their wealth and the desire to direct the course of British art. The institution's inaugural exhibition highlighted two closely related developments in British art of the previous half century, the rise of hybrid genres and the rise of art about empire. Products of the new urban exhibition culture funded by imperialism, industry, and enclosure, hybrid genres such as contemporary history painting or theatrical portraiture combine the scale and prestige of history with the immediacy of reportage. Instead of subjects from the classics and the Bible, these works depicted current events. As Jeff Quilly and Doug Fordham have explored, such works depicted far-flung imperial conflicts and featured diverse human subjects. Generic hybrids expanded both the types of people represented in art and the types of people consuming it. With their topical subject matter, sensationalist approach, and availability via urban displays, they moved beyond an audience of classically educated, supposedly disinterested gentlemen to appeal to all viewers, male and female, who could afford a shilling entrance fee, so in effect, the middle and upper classes. At the same time, art writers generated a new set of criteria for elevated art, one based not on erudite content, but rather on emotional appeal. Some art historians, such as David Sulkin and Martin Myrone, who have done important foundational work on the art of this period, view this development in the later 18th century as a fall from grace, an abandonment of the heroic ideals of the earlier 18th century in order to um, pander to the market. I believe that these new subjects and new viewers should instead be understood as a democratization of art. Yet these newer genres continue to rely upon a discourse of distinction, both in terms of class and also applied to the many different peoples integral to the British imperial project. Contemporary history painting showed figures of African or indigenous descent alongside English, Scottish, and colonial American subjects, negotiating the uneasy intimacy of imperial relations. When we use the term hybrid genre, we usually mean it in the most general sense, a combination of two things, such as a hybrid car. But I think we might also consider these genre-bending images in terms of the imperial ambivalence theorized by Homi Baba. Both hybrid genres and imperialist identities are haunted by an ideal of purity that is always already lost, be it history painting or whiteness. And these two hierarchies, the hierarchy of genres and the hierarchy of race, 
not only even to operate according to the same cultural logic, but also in this period, and indeed in our own, mutually reinforced one another. Although the British institution is often depicted as a conservative force in the British art world, and I should say not without justification, it was in this case at the forefront of the redefinition of elevated art. The founding documents express the hope that, quote, our artists may be encouraged to direct their ambitions to the higher and nobler attainments, end quote. And to that end, portraits were banned from the institution's exhibitions on the logic that they were already well provided for by um, patronage and that they were, could be shown at the academy. So in theory, portraits were not allowed to be shown at the institution. But in practice, the directors operated according to an extremely capacious definition of higher and nobler art. So in effect, if a work was even vaguely plausible as an example of elevated art, and thus of an emerging national school, it was included. The exhibition of 1806 was organized by a committee of directors, assisted by the keeper of the institution, um, the engraver Valentine Green. And here you see Green alongside some of the most influential members of this committee um, and their various sources of wealth. And some of these men were part of the traditional elite, the peerage, and some were not. But all of them, as you see here, had benefited from the twin economic engines of empire and industry. And I should note, indeed, that this is Charles Long, who we've seen before today, um, and um, who was part of the same family of the plantations that we saw in Rachel's talk. Um, he was the first cousin of Edward Long, who wrote the virulently racist history of Jamaica. These men made two crucial decisions that determined that the first institution show would be an exhibition unlike pre any previously seen in the capital. First, unlike the Royal Academy, the institution accepted previously exhibited artworks. As a result, the 1806 exhibition included many objects created years or even decades earlier, even as you see here, um, including works by artists who were already deceased, which would be sold for benefit of their families. And this created what was, in effect, a retrospective of the past 30 years of art. Second, the exhibition was arranged according to genre, providing an emphatic visual commentary on which types of art should be considered elevated and which inferior. The British Institution Galleries, and this image will be, I think, familiar to all of you by now, um, they consisted of three rooms. Um, and th you entered in a stairway through the middle room and were encouraged by the catalog to begin in the north room. And it was in these first two rooms that figurative works of all kinds, including history painting, physiognomies, genre painting, were displayed. In contrast, the, the, the quote unquote lesser genres of animal subjects, still life, and landscapes were relegated to the last gallery, the south room, which also crucially had the worst lighting of all three. So they were literally putting landscapes and still lifes in the dark. Thus, the overall disposition of this display affirmed the traditional hierarchy of genres. But the contents of those first two rooms, those elevated spaces, admitted many more types of works to the upper echelons, including generic hybrids. With one important exception that I will return to later, it was the scale of the human figures within the frame that determined where work would be placed. And it is worth noting that this response to recent artistic developments that is expanding the definition of the elevated while maintaining a tight lid on the lower orders has striking parallels to the larger British social situ situation at the time. Now, studying the contents of this exhibition proves quite a challenge. There are no period images of the 1806 display and precious few first-hand accounts. Fortunately, we know a lot about the appearance and size of the galleries, and the exhibition catalog provides detailed information about the dimensions and the locations of the work. So using those sources, I have crafted a speculative digital reconstruction of the display. And I'd like to really stress to you that this is indeed a speculative exercise. Uh, there's so much more that we don't know about this installation, including the fact that many of the exhibits are unlocated. Um, nonetheless, what you see here is my best judgment, and it is created using knowledge of period hanging conventions and also informed by in images of other institution displays. 
The directors employed the decorative style of hang, a mode familiar to them from the academy and also from their own personal collections. And in this style, large works or centerpieces were hung first, and the smaller works then arrayed around them as pendant pairs. In addition to pleasing symmetry, such pendants offered intriguing visual and conceptual dialogues, both intended and unintended by the organizers. Today I will focus on these centerpieces, but it's important to note that this was a work of over, uh, exhibition with over 250 works of art, so there are many more uh, juxtapositions and dialogues to be teased out from this display. Collectively, the contents of this exhibition pictured people from throughout the globe. For example, hanging in the middle room was an image by John Francis Rigo of the Mohawk leader known both as Tyendinaga and as Joseph Brandt. Um, as we heard about in Esther's paper yesterday, um, Brandt was a British ally who had fought in the American Revolution. And Rigo's oil painting is unlocated. But I'm really thrilled to be able to share with you today a new discovery. This is fresh from the archives. Um, I'm delighted to have made this connection um, and to share it here with you for the first time. Um, this is a watercolor that I believe is a rendition of Rigo's composition from that lost oil work. Um, and the reason I think that is because we have a very detailed description of the painting, and this watercolor matches that description down to the figures on the wampum belt that he holds. Um, so this has been in the um, Library and Archives Canada for many years, identified as a portrait of Joseph Brandt, but I am arguing here that it is a version of the Rigo composition, um, and I hope identifying who this artist is after, if not the watercolor artist, um, him, him or herself. So this was an exhibit of a work of a known individual in an exhibition that ostensibly, as you'll recall, banned portraits. And Brandt was, as we've learned, very well known in London um, and represented in many different images. And at this time, he was still alive and actually still drawing his half pay as a demobilized British officer. Um, so he's very much a known individual. Um, but Rigo circumvented the portrait ban um, by rechristening his painting, quote, the Mohawk Chief. And he wrote in a letter to his son about this, quote, we must not call it Joseph Brandt as they have determined not to receive portraits." End quote. <laughs> and indeed, the directors took him at his word and accepted um, the painting and gave it a very prominent place um, within the exhibition, one that reinforced um, this abstracting, anonymizing tendency. So it was installed to one side of this massive painting by Northcutt of Daniel in the Lion's Den. And it was installed as a pendant to a work by the deceased art artist John Hamilton Mortimer, an image of a knight from Spencer's Fairy Queen. <laughs> Visually, the two figures are strikingly similar. Both sport plumed headgear, billowing white shirts, red cloaks, and triangular sandals, and both assume elegant contrapposto poses. In the exhibition, these curved postures were arranged to counterbalance each other, almost as if opening and closing a parenthetical phrase. But what is the content of this phrase? For many viewers, this pairing would have evoked a well-established ideas of stadial development, conflating a contemporary indigenous warrior with a medieval British knight, English knight, I should say. Um, but while their visual similarity suggests a perceived kinship, other elements of the exhibition worked to undercut this process of identification. When the Rigo canvas had been shown originally at the Royal Academy in 1786, the catalog entry gave the protagonist English and Mohawk names, as well as, and I think this is crucial, his British military rank. But the new generic title transformed the image from a representation of a specific person to an ethnographic specimen. And I think it's really striking that this process of transformation is identical in the form of an exhibition to what Esther was showing us yesterday with um, quote unquote scientific publications that are using his image in a generic or representative form. Now questions of empire and difference were also even more prominently featured in the adjoining North Room which was the largest of the three. 
On the long west wall, which was on the viewer's left upon entry, the centerpiece was John Singleton Copley's Death of the Earl of Chatham. Displayed to great acclaim as a one-work exhibition in 1781, this painting depicts a politician collapsing in the midst of a speech against recognizing American independence. And in this work, Copley made the best of a bad job, picturing Chatham's death as a heroic sacrifice in the cause of empire, albeit on the floor of parliament rather than on the plains of Abraham. By admitting Copley's canvas and according it a prominent place, the directors affirmed its elevated status despite its plethora of portraits. And they certainly understood that these were portraits not only because this is a recent work, um, but because several of them, including the Marquis of Stafford, are prominently featured in this work. So they were hanging their own picture. Um, this painting had been first shown 25 years earlier as a representation of recent events, but now exhibited anew at the institution, it was burnished by time, less contemporary and more history with every passing day. Hung across the gallery as a facing pendant was a more recent work by Arthur William Davis. The decision to pair these two works, and I apologize for this slide, this is a work in a private collection. Um, but I think in pairing these two works, they were thinking about symmetry, certainly. Um, both of these are large scale, multi-figure horizontal compositions. Um, and, and if we had a color image, the um, red cloth in both would be very resonant. Um, but wittingly or not, the juxtaposition of these works created a narrative of recent history. On one wall, an empire is lost. On the other wall, an empire is gained. Copley depicts a debate over American independence after repeated military setbacks under General Charles Cornwallis. On the right, the same general is shown in triumph in India 14 years later, having defeated Tipu Sultan in the Third anglo mysore War in 1792. At the institution in 1806, in other words, the swing to the east much debated among historians could be achieved with a simple turn of the viewer's head. From the west wall to the east wall. The past conflicts in America and India pictured here were both, of course, part of the larger century-long struggle with France for control of imperial territories. And Copley's and Davis's pictures worked together to create a narrative of national achievement, picturing valor in the face of defeat and magnanimity in the aftermath of victory. Empire here is depicted as an exclusively masculine patrilineal endeavor. And in Copley's image, excuse me, um, his sons rushed to his aid. Um, and presumably when exhibited in 1806, these figures took on an added poignancy because um, two of his sons had died. James, a naval officer, had perished while serving in the West Indies. And William Pitt the Younger had died only a few weeks before the exhibition opened, a much more loss of a political leader in a time of war. And I should also say that my thinking about this painting has been so inspired by Nika's work. Um, and one way to think of this is a harmony, indeed, in pink, white, and red. And if you had the pleasure of viewing this in the National Portrait Gallery, it is among other things a catalog of complexions um, from the very, very pale to the kind of recognizably alcoholically flushed ruddy face. Um, and he re really spends loving a luscious amounts of time on painting the complexions in this work. Now, um, fathers and sons also play a central role in Divas' picture, where Tipu Sultan's officials surrender two of his sons. British propaganda celebrated Cornwallis as an adopted father rather than as, as he actually was a hostage taker. But the vision of these children being transferred from one family to another also raised more troubling associations. As Darcy Grimaldo Grigsby has shown, such images of British paternal care are haunted by the sexual and social realities of colonial society, including um, the separation of mothers from their children, um, similar to the situation um, that Rachel was speaking about in Jamaica. It was quite common um, for children of British fathers to be sent back to England and thus lost to their mothers for life. In addition, both royalty and children represent particularly potent figures for what Joseph Roach has called surrogation, the inhabiting of established roles by new actors. The cultural roles available for these young men were ominous indeed, given the popularity of images of royal children in peril, and the iconography used by Davis and others, um, scholars have noted, evoked the specter of the princes in the tower, and also more recently, the children of Louis XVI. 
In the exhibition of 1806, there was an equally menacing parallel. Hanging nearby on the same wall was Samuel Woodford's The Interview of Charles I with His Children, suggesting the ambivalence associated with both new imperial families and the overthrow of rulers. Such anxieties were also raised. Oh, sorry, that's, that's the Charles I. Um, and as you can see, uh, the visual parallels here are striking as well. Um, such anxieties were also raised by the centerpiece at the head of the room, which depicted the famous actor John Philip Kemble in a role from the play Pizarro, written by Richard Brindley Sheridan. Set during the Spanish invasion of Peru, Pizarro was first performed in 1799 when it was very much feared that a Napoleonic invasion was imminent. And Kemble played Rolla, an indigenous leader whose impassioned declaration of resistance to the Spanish was seen as a call to arms to British citizens. And this play becomes enormously popular for that reason and is sort of trotted out at times of, of stress mm -hmm. in war. Um, at the same time, Sheridan had included critique of the methods of British Empire by quoting directly from his own speeches at the trial of Warring Hastings. Um, and it's, it's a complicated and vexed text, but perhaps because it had something for everyone, this was an enormous hit. And Lawrence debuted this monumental portrait of Kemble at the following year at the Royal Academy. Um, and this depicts um, an iconic moment in the play, and it's always very hard to convince people that this is true, but Rolla is trying to protect this child that he is flinging into the air. I know it doesn't look like a very safe thing to do with a toddler, um, but he, the, the action, the theatrical action that you're not seeing is that they're being threatened by a group of Spanish soldiers and he's defending this child. Um, and this was one of a series of portraits that Lawrence did that he called, his, this is his own term, half history paintings. Um, and by according it the single most prominent place in the exhibition, I, the directors affirmed this claim that this work was in fact more than a simple portrait, that it was at least half history. Interestingly, however, the figures depicted here violate any number of social boundaries. To start with, you have Lawrence depicting a British actor playing an indigenous warrior. Yet, as was noted in the press when the work was first shown, only the head belonged to Kemble. The body was instead modeled on the body of a famous boxing instructor um, titled Gentleman Jackson. And uh, this was a fusion that many reviewers found troubling and indeed could identify not only that the body wasn't Kemble's because they knew the actor's form and he just wasn't that buff, apparently. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, it was actually specifically noted this was Jackson's body. And they, it was, they were visually ident identifying a specific human and they found this very troubling. Um, and this very muscular form bolsters the idea that this is history, um, that vocabulary of the muscular body, um, but it made it less effective as a portrait of the actor. And there was also clear anxiety about the working class origins of this specific body. And the same thing is true of the child who Rolla protects. In the text of the play, the child is the product of a union between a Spanish soldier and a South American woman whose name is Cora. On stage, the child was also embodied a cross-class union. Cora was played by Dorothy Jordan, and as was customary at the time, the child was played by her five-month-old daughter, one of the many children she bore out of wedlock to the royal Duke of Clarence. For his picture, however, Lawrence chose a less provocative model, the playwright's own son. As Sheer West has shown, Lawrence's picture omits the more radical aspects of the play, instead emphasizing Kemble's role as an avatar of the British elite. The work's installation in 1806 continued that trend by showing it alongside classical sculptures and images of Achilles. Lawrence's painting, in other words, depicts an indigenous subject become a classical warrior, become an English actor, become an English aristocrat. In this cascade of surrogated identities enacted at the institution in 1806, Rolla, as painted by Lawrence, embodies both the people to be conquered and the men charged with conquering them, such as Chatham and Cornwallis pictured on the adjoining walls. But this play of identities, this ferocious appropriation of images of the other for British purposes had its limits. The final centerpiece that I will discuss today involves instead an act of erasure. 
And to look at this, I want to invite you to imagine turning your back on the Rolla and walking with me the length of the three galleries past the portrait of Brandt in the middle room to the south room. Um, and the work we're going to talk about is what you see framed in the archway there. In the south room hung another South American subject, James Ward's massive 10 by 14 foot canvas titled The Laboya Serpent. The title suggests a setting in the Dutch colony of Suriname, and I should say also formerly English colony of Suriname, recently brought to the attention of the British public by James Steadman's narrative. The work is lost today, um, but it is known through studies. As you see here, um, it depicts a dark-skinned man astride a white horse, his body drawn backward by the coils of a massive snake. One vivid study indicates that Ward's model was of African descent, while the overall compositional sketch includes a slightly different figure and a feathered headdress employed at the time as an imprecise sign of the exotic. Ward's image drew on well-known precedents, especially the work of George Stubbs. And visitors in 1806 would not have had far to look for this precedent as one of Stubbs' many renditions of animal combat was on view in the same room. And remember, this is the, um, the room for the quote unquote lesser genres. But by introducing a human protagonist and working on a monumental scale, Ward sought elevated status as Lawrence had successfully done with his half history paintings. But it's, his efforts met with much less success. The work was rejected by the Academy in 1804. And although it was admitted to the institution two years later, its placement was a backhanded compliment. Hung in the center of the southernmost wall, it could be seen from all three rooms. But it was also relegated to the gallery reserved for lesser genres. And as you will recall, Northcote's Daniel in the Lion's Den was given a place of honor in the middle room, and that is despite a very similar human to animal ratio in the composition. In contrast, Ward's work was segregated from the other monumental figure paintings on view, essentially categorizing this as an enormous animal painting. To do so, of course, the directors had to perform an act of willful blindness, ignoring the life-size human figure at the center of the painting. To date, scholars have equivocated over the meaning of Ward's composition. Some propose it as an allegorical condemnation of the slave trade. Others sense a connection, but are unwilling to describe it as a straightforward abolitionist protest. Its treatment by the administrators of the institution, however, exemplifies a different aspect of the debate over abolition, the development of new racist ideologies and the intensification of old ones. This exhibition was assembled in order to demonstrate the abilities of British artists, and it highlighted their work in innovative genres that were at once significant and popular. At the same time, it provided a portrait of the British racial imagination and of the processes of identification and erasure that made the expansion of empire palatable to a metropolitan audience. In this installation, the supine dark skin form depicted by Ward operated as a pendant to the upright, paler body painted by Lawrence. As part of the imperial projects, some subjects were whitewashed and some were simply erased. And art institutions and art exhibitions were important venues for these insidious processes, not only because of which objects were shown, but of how they were shown and where they were placed. Thank you.